Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join our uh, webinar. We're going to be talking about private equity and economic recovery in the U.S. and in Brazil. I see we have a few familiar faces. We can talk up with uh, name a few people later on. Right now, I am very happy to be here with my friend and my um, business school buddy who has been working in private equity for the past, like I think more than 10 years, right, Rashad? Yeah, it's about 19 years. Yeah. 19 years, that, that's more than 10, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we're gonna try to uh, have this conversation with focus on uh, the perspective of uh, someone that does like a macroeconomic research and, and run analysis for banks like me. And then from an investor perspective, like Rashad, right, which is more as a portfolio slash like firm centric view of markets, right? So uh, we didn't script anything. This is going to be very, fl uh, very flow oriented. We're going to try to make it very relaxed. And the goal is really to to uh, share knowledge and, and, and share our understanding, which might not be the best understanding, but is certainly a valid understanding of people who are in the market and who um, have a New York and global view um, of markets right now. So we were like chatting before, like I was talking about like some of the Wharton books that I still have. You said you donated a few of them, right? Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I mean, after a certain number of years of fasting your career, you know, you look back and then some of the books pretty useful. Um, you look back and you can use it as a reference. And some of the stuff, you know, it's it was a good academic kind of theoretical framework. But, um, you know, you, you really don't look back at that stuff as much, certain things. And so some of those I finally just let go. I said, look, like, if I haven't looked at them yet, I'm probably not going to. So I just donated. it. So uh, do you remember any books that, like, uh, you like that you that you come back to? Or not really? It's just more like uh, the yeah, hand. This could be, it's surprising because, uh, you know, my main focus was finance. And my career has been in finance. Um, but it, it's interesting, like the books that I would look back on more are really kind of more straightforward, you know, stuff like accounting or, um, stuff that I didn't focus on that, um, have informed some of the stuff, you know, that I do for work, like marketing that weren't necessarily my area of focus. Um, conversely, my finance books, I've done, those are the ones I don't hate. <laughs> not because, you know, not because they were useless or anything. It's because the, just the theoretical framework of the finance stuff we learned in school, um, it was great because it, it laid the foundations and kind of the theoretical, um, you know, approach, the basics, right? Like rate of return, NPV, discounted cash flow, some of that real bedrock foundational stuff about finance. Um, but Beyond those foundational layers, those, our finance course coursework got into such theoretical and deep kind of topics. They took them to these crazy equations and econometric, like, you know, topics that um, the, the foundation layers I used a lot in my career to the point where it's so many reps that I don't actually need to, re you know, reference it. And the more theoretical layers, you know, I, we don't really use, we don't get into that much detail in the finances. It's it's, an, it's amazing that core, it's like the Predo rule, like the core 20% of what we learned in finance, I'm probably using 80% of the time. Maybe it's even more, maybe it's 10%, 90. Um, and then back to those other areas where I surprisingly, I wouldn't have thought that I would, you know, would be interested in those topics, but like mundane things like accounting, mean, no offense to accounting, accounting or accountants, but, um, you know, but it's, it's very, you know, specific knowledge and you know a lot of times we're dealing with stuff at different types of businesses and industries and that accounting um stuff is stuff that i can look up and it really helps me understand when i'm trying to interpret a PL or a you know cash flow statement or whatever for a certain company um and then you know as i mentioned like marketing and some of these areas that were a little bit more you know qualitative than quantitative at the time that seemed a little bit more case oriented um, and hard to kind of 
figure out how that plays out in the real world when I was in a classroom has played out, you know, vividly in the real world as I'm making investments and working with companies. You know, you see a, a case study about a marketing decision about how to, you know, market a certain brand and, and segment your consumers in, in a certain market and then how to, you know, target each of those consumers and um, look at the efficiency of your, uh, you know, advertising spend. Those kinds of things that were kind of abstract in school. Now that we're, we're working with real companies that are trying to make similar decisions, it's kind of useful to see those case studies. And now it, it takes on a different life now than it did when I was in class and it just kind of seemed random. So. Yeah, um, I think it's very interesting that you're saying that because if you look at my company right now, I have basically I have one person that uh, is an economist that actually helps me do the modeling and the research, and then I have two people in marketing, right? So it, it really shows that like we really need to study more marketing, right? And and it's like uh, and and like you said, I have my whole career in finance as well, right? And my my business is mostly finance. Who really need a lot of marketing to boost sales, right? And then, like, and you probably see the same thing in your portfolio companies, right? But you probably see that, like, from a perspective of uh, return on marketing spending, right? That's like, uh, I think your perspective is more to look at um, how much you're spending on marketing and how much sales you're getting, right? And then uh, you're trying to compare how effective that is, right? Yeah. Exactly. Do you ever get to micromanage to the point when you're looking at a portfolio company that your private equity fund owns and you see, okay, this strategy is not working as well as we thought? What what do you guys think that you should do to change it, to improve it? And do you go and say, no, let's go with A instead of B? Or do you leave to like the chief marketing officer and you very rarely is going to interfere on that kind of decision? That's a good question. And just specifically through the lens of marketing to say, um, just to back up a little bit, um, to give a picture of the firm that I work with, it's a firm called BRS, Martin Ross or Cheryl. It's a private equity firm formed in 1995. We're a middle market private equity firm. And a lot of companies we work with are entrepreneur owned businesses where we're the first institutional capital. So we're not doing these, you know, mega, multi-billion dollar Blackstone deals with these you know, massive public companies. These are typically more scrappy, uh, entrepreneur-owned businesses, really dynamic growth stories that were coming in as a first institutional capital. So in a lot of these cases, there actually isn't a business chief marketing officer. There might be um, you know, a VP level marketing person. Um, there might be you know, a small marketing team, mid-sized marketing team. Um, you know, and it might be routed up through the sales function. So just to give you a picture, they're not the most, um, you know, th this isn't like P and Procter and Gamble with like this, you know, PhDs and marketing, you know, super um, quantitative and, and metric driven. But um, now to lay, to lay in kind of the, the response to your, to your question, um, yes, we often do get involved in, you know, whether it's marketing or other aspects of the business, looking at it and, and trying to bring analytical tool set and to say like you know like you said like where are you spending the money how what kind of the prop what's the profitability where what kind of return are you getting in, in this case in the by mode of marketing different types of digital marketing non-digital marketing um you know we often bring in agencies you know digital agencies amazon agencies d2c agencies um we bring in marketing and rebranding you know firms that help bring in some creative and packaging and other, you know, digital marketing, um, you know, look and feel uh, aspects to it. So we we work, we often bring uh, and and try to push, get more professionalization and sophistication in in marketing. But uh, just to tying it back to one of the earlier points we were talking about in terms of the, the fundamental concepts, it's about like. Some of the biggest takeaways I had in um, going to Wharton with you and um, you know learning finance, those those foundational things about uh, a finance like return. Right? I mean, it really comes down to how do you best measure um, your return on investments. A lot of decisions, whether operational, marketing, sales, are about you know asking the right questions and measuring. How, what's the best way to measure? You know, if I'm putting an, you know, an hour of a resource or a dollar of investment into something, 
you know, what's the return from that? And that's such a fat basic financial concept. And, you know, it's amazing. You'll see companies that have done really well that have grown at a 20, 30% favor and, you know, are exploding in, in their industry. Um, but by the time we invest in them, you know, they don't think that way. And, you know, in terms of the discipline of, should I put a dollar of marketing into social? Should I put it into basic digital marketing? Um, should I put it into SEO? Should I put it into other forms of, you know, marketing like moral school media? Um, should I put it into trade marketing? Should I put it into promotional marketing at a retailer? If there's so many different ways you can spend the money, um, and that's just marketing. I'm not even getting into sales and I'm not even touching all the operational aspects of the business. But, you know, that, that basic thing that we learned is kind of the foundation in finance and business. Um, it's not the complex end of it. It's just the basic form of it helps us kind of, uh, you know, get, bring some method to the madness in some of these companies that are growing fast, but don't exactly really measure or know where they're getting the best you know, return. Yeah. Well, uh, this is very interesting because sometimes we, we have this view that private equity, like New York, even if you're like middle market, because if you think about it, like real private equity is middle market, right? This is like behemoth that like when like Goldman has a division that does PE, that's not really PE, right? That becomes like a, a, or specs, right? This, this stuff is not really private equity, right? The way that it was supposed to be that you get a company and you do an LBO or you do a management turnaround and you try to make them turn them into a profitable business, right? But but uh, but what I wanted to say is that like, yeah, I see that uh, when, when you start your own business, you're like, you have to deal with so many options that are even less structured than the decisions that you have to deal with, right? And you're saying that like you deal with like, uh, entrepreneurs who start their own business. And, and just to give us an idea, what kind of business, I remember we used to talk about it when I, I go to New York more often. And I know that I need to go to New York so we can hang out. But uh, uh, like, uh, what, what, what kind of business are you guys investing like these days? And has it changed because of COVID or no? Uh, good question. So, I mean, just generally speaking, what we've, um, the area that we've specialized the most over the past um you know, for me, 18 years at this firm and uh, a little over 18 years, actually, and our firm, uh, you know, since 1995 overall has been a kind of broad kind of consumer business services, including what we would call retail. Now we call it omnichannel, right? Nothing is just retail. You know, you have some D2C, you have some Amazon, or otherwise you're not going to survive. Um, and so um, whether it's the actual goods, uh, the packaged goods, you know, that, that a company is trying to sell and market, develop, sell and market. Um, or the retail distribution of that, you know, the brick and mortar retailers, uh, again, omni-channel retailers. Um, and then not just good, but services as well. Like, for example, one of my companies is a fitness club chain. Obviously, we're selling fitness, you know, services and so on. Um, so goods and services in the broad kind of consumer spectrum. We also invest in, um, and this is just, again, this is just where we have to focus. That's just me and my slice of the pie, my art of firm. We also focus on um, areas kind of peripheral to consumers. So there's, um, you think about, and, and we're investing a lot in the goods and then the actual retailers. You, you tend to learn about all the distribution in between, so specialty distributors that kind of work in the, the, the supply chain, getting from company to its retailers. So um, we've invested in specialty distributors and also some light assembly, light manufacturing of components that get go into kind of um, general consumer goods. So there's a couple of peripheral areas, but all kind of revolving around and orbit around the consumer world. Um, in terms of COVID, you know, it's been a wild, wild ride. I mean, we're sitting here a little over a year ago. And, you know, from you think from the consumer industry perspective, it was like apocalyptic, like the whole uh, country's ground to a halt, you know, lockdowns and all that stuff. Never seen anything like that kind of an economic disruption. And, you know, we went into kind of survival, you know, survival mode, triage. Uh, and luckily we were experienced here. We've been through, we went through the 08 09 recession, which obviously hit consumers a lot as over, you know, leveraged balance sheets, meaning people were over, you know, at big mortgages and finished consumer debt. And so that was a massive consumer recession. And, you know, the, the recession back in uh, the early century, uh, beginning of the century. But um, so we kind of had experience in terms of working with companies that, and so we knew kind of the focus areas of focus, like cash flow, preservation, 
um, operational initiatives, some new things with COVID that were kind of un, you know uncharted territory, obviously, in terms of regulations and, and all that. Working with our financing sources to you know bolster cash flow, things like that. So it's a survival mode. And next thing you know, you know, as things started, uh, you know, these these stimulus money started coming through. Um, some of the companies, you know, a lot of the companies we own started doing not just good, but like very well. And, um, you know, and, the, and some of the side effects of like stimulus money coming in and then people having, um, you know, unleveraged balance sheets, right? Like in 08, 09 recession, people were over, there was all, a lot of consumer debt. There was a lot of mortgages, houses that were underwater. People were so leveraged that, the, you know, savings rates um, increased. People stopped spending money. And they were hurting, right? Their wallets were hurting. You know, the balance sheets were hurting. This time, you can spend the money, right? Like you can't go out, you can't do anything, and so that combined with the stimulus um, to support people that you know obviously had were unemployed, but even people that were not un, uh, unemployed obviously got checks. Um, we just started seeing these these crazy um, you know uh, tailwinds in a number of industries that we have to invest in. And, you know, certain companies, oh, and sorry, and the, and the whole work from home thing as well, right? Like certain areas, you can't do, you can go to restaurants, you can't go to, you know, you can't do certain things, but, you know, you can do outdoor recreation now because you're trying to get out of the house. Um, you know, you can work from home, so you could do, you know, I don't know, like, for example, one of my cousins uh, down in Texas, they bought a, a tent to go camping in their backyard. Like, they're so bored of staying home. Um, you know, they were buying puzzles, right? They were buying toys. They were doing crafting. They're doing all these things that they, they, they couldn't do stuff outside the house. And so, um, you know, we've happened to have made investments in certain areas that are enthusiast areas as part of our thesis. So after recreation, um, hobbies, things like that, where you have like a loyal sticky consumer base. And these companies sales were up 20, 30%. I and mean, one of our companies sales were up 90%. Um, and so, uh, we went from this panic mode of like, you know, survival, cash flow preservation to these incredible like tailwinds um, across some companies. Now, certain companies, um, you know, obviously hurt. We have one restaurant chain, um, you know, and it made it through and it's you know, obviously doing well now with reopening. Uh, we have a gym chain that I mentioned that hurt because it was just literally shut down. And it depends on the state, obviously different state, different politics, different regulations. Um, but, you know, overall, obviously it was not good to be in a gym chain, but, um, you know, coming out of it now, I'd say last few months, you know, sales at the gym chain versus 2019 pre COVID sales were up 10, 20%. You know, people are crowding back in because they miss, you know, they've been cooped up. And, um, so yeah, interestingly, there, there's, uh, that, that's kind of been the ride in terms of like the companies we've been invested in, in terms of companies we're seeing in the MA market coming you know, in terms of new opportunities. Um, it's also really interesting. There are companies that have done, um, that have benefited, as you can say, intuitively from what I just said. So we're seeing a lot of like home goods companies, you know, home goods, um, crafts around the house, uh, again, outdoor recreation, um, things that did well from working from home um, where people spent stimulus money and, you know, money they couldn't spend out, you know, in services and outside the house. They spend on certain types of goods. Um, we're seeing a lot of these companies, arts, crafts, supplements, like in the health industry, we're seeing a lot of that activity because people were focused on their health and immunity. So a lot of supplement companies got a big boost. Certain areas that you can, everyone on the call can intuitively just think, hey, what did my family do? What do they spend their money on? What do our friends do? From that, you could extrapolate. Those are the companies we're seeing. And we're seeing a flood of companies in those areas, you know, Stimulus money help, the economic recovery help, people can spend money on other stuff. Certain areas got really uh, benefited. Certain areas that obviously got hurt were not seeing as much. Um, you know, there's, you know, in the recovery phase. So, you know, you think services, you think like restaurants, you think gyms, um, you know, things like that. Um, but it's an interesting time for, for us because there's a huge influx of, of potential transactions and companies that are looking for it to sell. Um, because they had this big, in certain sectors, they had this big uh, 2020, 20, you know, early 2021, based on the factors that I mentioned. But, you know, as investors, we're looking at it and we're like, well, is this sustainable? 
you know, is this something that's going to last, you know, reopening or, uh, you know, I'll tell you, we've got like fitness equipment businesses, like incredible, ridiculous P&L stories, um, you know, EBITDA increasing by 300 to 500% in you know, COVID. And, you know, they'll make an argument that, you know, it's a permanent shift to some extent. There's some people that realize they can work out at home and that, that they would rather not be in a gym and not be crowded and all these people. But when you're on the cusp of reopening and people are excited to get out of the house, it's hard to figure out, well, you know, what what is your valuation? How do you value a company like that? You know, is it going to go back to the pre-COVID normal? Is it going to go to a new normal? It's definitely not going to be where it was the last 12 months. So these are some of the things we're struggling with. Yeah. Um, so this is very cool. And, uh, and sorry for interrupt, but, and I really liked your flow. Like, uh, you said like a lot of very interesting things, um, like, and there's so much, so much to comment. And even like on, on the topic that we we're talking before, and I interrupted myself to ask you a question, but coming back to the point in order to comment, comment on what you're saying, I, I had like so many questions. First of all, like, uh, something that, uh, grabbed my attention, like, what is the you don't need to tell me the name of the company uh but what is the what is the sector of the company or what kind of business the company that got the 90% growth that you've said there's one company that got 90% so just like just to know that would be cool uh, another thing that i would like to ask is like uh related to and actually to comment right um because we do research and you're saying it's hard to comment to to analyze like the the home equipment, home workout uh, equipment manufacturer, right? Like the the like kind of like Nordica and and Peloton, right? That kind of like uh, exercise bicycles kind of thing, and and um, and this is something that I used to talk a lot with a friend of ours from business school. At some point, he was trying to start a open uh, start an app. And, and we use a lot of the metaphor of the exercise bike, right? Because uh, it's, it's not that you're going to get in shape with the exercise bike, right? But it's good that you have that in your house. So you can do that a little bit. And, and if you less guilty about yourself, right? So a lot of people, especially when they live, like we live in the city, right? We live in New York. I live in Washington. And we don't have a lot of room. But a lot of people who have like an exercise bike, especially if they live in a house in the suburbs, right? So, and it's not necessarily that they're like doing all their workout with that bicycle and they're going to get extremely fit with that bicycle, but it's just a peace of mind that, oh, I bought the bicycle. So now, you know, like nobody can say anything about me. Right. So, um, and then like, I'm, I'm telling you the story um, because I think that, yes, there was a huge surge like in Peloton and uh, Nordica and all these companies, right. That sell exercise bikes and, and, and uh, weight lift, like, uh, you know, lose weights, right, for you to work out. But I, I think that um, they should they should come back to, uh, um, you know, which is it's like um, a lot of people say that, but I think it's right at this point. Like, uh, I think it's going to be somewhere in between the pre-COVID and um, – and COVID, right? I think it's not going to be an automatically uh, uh, decline to pre-COVID, right? I think there'll still be people who are going to be like, oh, yeah, my buddy bought the bicycle. So I'm going to buy the bicycle as well, right? Because after all, it's good to have a bicycle at home. Not necessarily that you're going to get fit with it, but, you know, you think that this is useful and then and then you do that. But eventually, like, th th there's going to be some attrition to that growth, and then it's going to come back to the norm, right? So this is the way that I see, like, for that, you know, if I were to, to comment on, on, on this particular industry. Um, like, uh, it, it's very in interesting the, uh, what you said, that, like, in the beginning, you, you had, like, uh, there was a little bit of desperation in some of the uh, portfolio companies. And then everything started, like, the stimulus money came in. And something that a lot of people don't spell out when they talk about stimulus. I think a very important thing that the Fed did was to start buying like uh, insolvent bonds, right? There was a huge push to buy low rated bonds. And also uh, that uh, the Fed actually invested in funds that invested in public equities, right? And there was a huge rally in the market. And the market went up like irrationally, right? Like valuations are through the roof. And um, I think because of that, that that created a, a sense of wealth 
in society. And then people were able to sell their shares. And, and also because they're not spending much money at home, they start buying new cars. Like uh, I bought a car, right? Like uh, a new car and everybody start doing this kind of stuff. And, and I think it's, it's like you said, you know, it's very instinctive. Like you look at what's happening in, um, in around you and that's how, uh, and that's what happens to the portfolio companies. So I wanted to ask you, like, uh, first of all, what industry and what, why do you think that the, that particular business got the 90% growth? And, uh, and also, like, um, how do you see things going forward? Uh, do you think that things will, w this rally is going to continue? Or do you think that uh, we're going to come back to pre-COVID in terms of revenue? Or you think we, we're doomed for a correction because of inflation and uh, other fears that the market, and, and, and just like valuations being way ahead of themselves. What, what's your view, my friend? Yeah, so a few, thank you. Um, so yeah, a lot of good points for questions and conversations. Um, so I'll start with that one, the 90%. So yeah, there are some companies that are 20%, 30%. Yeah. Um, and those were generally companies that um, saw benefits from you know working from home and uh, not being able to spend money on other things. The one that would really stood out when I said 90%, uh, it hovered between 60 and 90, depending on the time of uh, the year. But that one, and I, I probably, because um, there's some uh, confidentiality issues probably, but I'll tell you as much, Spectre. I'll give you, I'll give you like kind of one tidbit, which is um, it sells kind of discretionary items uh fashion oriented items to lower income consumers actually oh and um so that was stimulus package right there like in injected in the in the blood right exactly it was like literally injected into blood is a metaphor I, it was i mean that money came and i'm not a macro economist and you yeah. know this a lot a lot more because i've been you know we kind of do our thing with individual companies and so i don't have a good broad view although i'm you know generally kind of aware but you know i'll tell you like in the trenches with that particular company and seeing companies like that i mean lower income consumers is interesting the stimulus but if i had to guess the stimulus money went into the pocket one pocket and out of the pocket like it got spent and like i don't know again i don't know what the economists say but i'm guessing um and it intuitively makes sense that lower income consumers I mean, there's, you can look at it two ways. One could theorize, you know, lower income and times are kind of crazy or unpredictable and, and you just, you know, things are always riskier, right? You have lower income. You know, me personally, I probably would save money. I'd save money. I'd put it in the bank and I'd probably put it away because I'm scared or maybe I have like a risk averse issue there. But as a whole and aggregate, it seems like lower income consumers, they got stimulus money and they're like, let's spend it. And it was like a shot in the blood. It came in one one pocket out the other pocket. Yeah, and, and actually, if I could even add and agree with what you said, and and trying to match what you said, like seeing the market on the street, and um and and what macroeconomists are saying, a lot of them said that uh, people use the stimulus money to pay off debt, right? So they got the money and they paid off their credit card bills. Then they took their credit cards out and they went out spending. I went yeah, re leverage, right? Same thing. Leverage even more because now the credit credit levels went up. That's right. Yeah. And and whoever go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Rashad. I was just saying rates were low. So I was just going, I was ripping off what you're saying. No, it's just like uh, and then like now that they have more credit, and then like and the people who had their own houses, the people who had like uh some a little bit of stocks and they saw the appreciation in their portfolio, they sold a little bit of that and went to the market as well. Or they spent more on their credit card thinking, hey, my 401k is so lush now, right? I don't need to worry about that. I can spend more. And 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 I think that uh, that was like uh what also fueled the 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 boom, you know. So like um um I know you're 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 American and you're like very much based in New York and Wall Street, but do you have any idea of uh, how COVID and and how the crisis is being played out like in the rest of the world? Do you have like uh, do you th do you have an opinion on this? Do you have a view or not so much right now? Yeah, you know I don't have Just a New York, New York. 
Yeah, I don't have a highly informed, you know, more U.S. centric and Canada. I have actually have some. It's a complete coincidence. about three portfolio companies in Canada. Um, we just find there's a lot of opportunity, good opportunities there. Um, so U.S. and Canada. Canada was basically like one of the more um, uh, harsh kind of U.S. states in terms of locking stuff down. Like they they lock stuff down pretty aggressively, kind of like California or even more. I like uh, that. I like. I like Rashad. I like that you called Canada the harshest U.S. state. I think it was good. I didn't say that. I didn't, for the record, I didn't but say it that. sounded but, like it, and I'll take it. COVID, like how did COVID affect the economy? I loved it. I loved they, it. They they locked it. You know, it's been pretty, pretty, pretty. Uh, yeah. And I, I'll tell you, you know, Bernardo, you know, I uh, spent a lot of the last year in Texas. I grew up in Texas. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And, you know, spent time with family there. In Texas, uh, so I, it's interesting. I saw New York it was very locked down. I visited okay. California at one point last year for to look at a company because I used to live there. That was very locked down. Texas was like my last summer. I was like nothing. COVID never happened. And, <laughs> uh, my company is in Canada. It's like they're they're a month behind. You know the last U.S. state here, I and mean, they're still in terms of vaccinations and yeah. uh, reopening. They're still very locked, in, relatively locked down. Uh, I don't know at this very moment, but they're, you know, so it's interesting. You see a broad spectrum of approaches even within the 50 U.S. states and Canada, um, but I don't know much outside of that, honestly. No, but I, I, I was, I, I was like uh, playing with what you said because, like, from a business perspective, Canada is very integrated, right? And 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 we 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 take it as a sovereign risk as U.S. the most part, right? There's just a little bit of currency risk, but not really. But everything is kind of part of the same market, right? Got it. And that's why I have three investments. You you nailed it. That's exactly why. You wouldn't <laughs> think, but that's it. That's our only you know cross border investing so far. Yeah, and, and, and it's like, and if you think about it, it's even like more U.S. if you're in Toronto than like the deep south, so to speak, right? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, because then, then then things are get a little bit weird. We don't know. Where we stand, but like if you go like Louisiana, Alabama, and Missouri, that kind of stuff, then it's a little bit more different than if you go like Canada, Toronto, right? It's it's more like um, business, more or less the same way as here in the U.S. Yeah, I New um, York has more in common than with Toronto than with Alabama, and yeah. California has more, in, and Washington has more in common with Vancouver and British Columbia than with Florida, probably. So it's a diverse, but But you're right. It, 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 you could kind of put it in one bucket of not a lot of sovereign risk or cross border risk. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. Um, like um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the rest of the world because I think that's a little bit of what we bring to the table. And um, and actually, I, I've been I've been on the on the on the macro equity research pieces that we've been publishing here. Uh, we've been pushing this idea that, yeah, the recovery is very strong. And uh, yes, the economy is very solid. Um, yes, like maybe there's not a lot of fear uh, of inflation because uh, the Fed has been handling things well. But I think that at some level, the the lack of improvement in the COVID recovery abroad is going to impact the U.S. economy on some level, you know, because if you look at like what's going on in Latin America, right? Like you have like Brazil, which is like, you know, a country where I have like my, all my staff is in Brazil. I have like one person in Europe, um, but um, um, we have um, the business is, is, is very much like the economy is very much uh, impacted by COVID. Uh, it, it's growing a little bit, surprisingly, but but you don't see the the level of strength, you know, and and and, uh, and the social impact has been very severe in Brazil, you know. So what we're we're seeing is that um, a country that uh, has a, a very large economy that was was ready to recover from like this worst crisis in its history uh, has not been able because of COVID and the way that it was handled. And I don't want to get into politics and say the president was good or bad, but uh, I just see that like overall Brazil is the third country in the world in terms of vaccination. And 
and but it's still like on a per capita base it still needs to improve a little bit but not so much because it's more or less around 60 70 percent of uh, the vaccination rates of uh, comparable countries in europe like portugal spain and italy they're more or less like they're on a level that Brazil is 60 or 70 percent of those countries in terms of a pro rate of vaccination and um but and then like you think okay so if brazil like eventually like uh, gets to the level of these European countries or gets to a vaccination level of 40 or 50 percent, then things should be uh, better and the economy should become as open as the American economy. And that's what I, I was thinking until I start talking. I have a consultant that works for us uh, on a lot of uh, deals and he's based in Santiago in Chile. And Chile is a country that has invested uh, a lot in vaccination and they have a higher vaccination rate in the United States. But the problem is that there are a few small countries that have a higher vaccination rate in the U.S., namely Chile, Israel, uh, the U.K., and and I think someone else I, I forgot. Anyway, so what happened is that Chile has a higher vaccination rate in the U.S., but it is the death rate is extremely high. The death rate in Chile is around 100 to 100 people a day. Even they have more people vaccinated than the U.S. And the U.S. vaccination, the U.S. death rate has been around 100 to 100, 300 people a day. And the U.S. is um, has 20 times more people than Chile, right? So it's amazing that Chile has so, so many deaths still at this moment, even though vaccination has been very severe. Um, there are like two ideas that are going on. Like one is like that they're vaccinating per- apparently with the Chinese vaccine, which is supposed to be very good, but perhaps not as efficient as the Pfizer vaccine. So there's still some debate on that. Uh, another issue is that the, the variant in Latin America is uh, the, the vaccine. I, I actually saw Dr. Fauci saying this, the, the, the variant in Latin America uh, is not, um, like the vaccines doesn't work so well for the Latin American variant, for the Brazilian variant, right? Which is a gamma type or whatever. And, and, and it's even less efficient to the Indian variant. And that's what I wanted to talk about. Because in India, like the, the, the situation is ravaging. And I think it's probably the same thing in Pakistan and, and Bangladesh. I don't know if you, if you know what's going on in, in, in South Asia. But it, it's been going very severe there because the variant, the vaccine is not as efficient uh, to the variant in India, right? So apparently like the U.S. variant, uh, the vaccine is like 90, 95% efficient, right, in terms of avoiding death. And then Latin America, they don't say the numbers, but it would be something like 70% or 60. And then the Indian variant would be something 40, 50%, right? So the pro, and then it would be like, okay, so uh, we'll take more vaccination, right? And then when these countries get to the, that level of vaccination, things will be fine. But what's happening right now is that in the UK, they, 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 they reinstalled their lockdown because the, the, the Indian variant is becoming the predominant variant there, right? And the UK has more vaccination rates than the US, right? So, and, and, and the, Indian, the Indian variant and the Brazilian variant are present in the United States. And by the rate of growth, I just saw Mr. Uh, Dr. Gupta, Sanjay Gupta, talking about this. Uh, the, the Indian variant should be the dominant variant in the United States. In the in the coming months, right? But so, what I think is that um, first of all, we need to focus right now on like because I see that the G seven they're going to give a billion shots next year to the developing countries. I think they need to focus on getting shots right now to the developing world because like otherwise we're going to have this back here again. Right. Because like it's not that even with 50, 60 percent of people vaccinated. Right. Th- these people will still be um, not necessarily as uh, prepared against the, vac- the disease as they were if it was only the U.S. variant, because now we have the Brazilian variant and the South Asian variant. Right. So those those things might disrupt the um, the, the recovery here in the U.S. 
they are disrupting, they're not allowing a country like the UK and a country like Chile, which have vaccinated more than the US, to reopen. So those are the things that like um that raise concern for me, you know, and I see here in the US, like you you, you just told me, because you're like you're on the street, right? You're like New York, private equity, Wall Street, like you're like seeing reality live in front of your eyes and everything is going amazingly well. Is there like all that stuff that I told you, like, did you ever hear anyone talk about this this way? Is there any talk of like um, dark, dark days ahead? Is there any talk of like, we need to cash out now? Or it's like, let's ride the rainbow kind of thing. What do you think? I don't know. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I'd, I'd say um, people, I, I haven't heard dark days ahead a lot from people uh, across our companies or in the local community here. Um, I think people have, <laughs> you know, the classic human thing. It's like people have a little bit of myopia and they have a little bit of short memories. And so uh, you know, I was worried, right, about these variants, um, and I'd I'd find myself, you know, trying to pick out and read articles about how these, like you said, how the vaccine form against the variants, and then how you could reprogram, you know, for example, the mr the RNA, mRNA vaccines with the you know sequences to help target, you know, the evolving variants and stuff, and how that could be a countermeasure at all. So I was thinking about it, and of course. You know, so th there's so many different topics we talk about with vaccines and the, the virus. But big picture, to answer your question, you know, it seems as stuff has been coming. You know, rates locally have come down. And when I say locally, I mean pretty locally, I mean down to the state level. Um, people have kind of viewed it as uh, they don't worry too much about it going the other direction locally. Um, and uh, and an interesting thing is it really depends on. Uh, the culture, the experience, politics, all these different things down to the state level, even like in Texas, people were acting like, you know, where I stayed a lot of last year. I mean, by late summer, people, you know, it was like people had moved on, like we're over it. Even, I mean, it had just come off a big spike in the summer and the hospitals were nearing capacity and all that stuff. One of the biggest medical centers in the world, Houston. And people were kind of moving past it mentally, whether it's realistic or not, or practical or not, they just weren't. You know, here it's been in New York, it's been a very um it's been a very vivid recovery and reopening in the last uh, you know, four to six weeks. I'll, let's call it six weeks. Each of the last six weeks, I'd say approximately, was worth like a month to two months of the recovery up until then. Like in terms of just foot traffic, people coming back, businesses with people in them, you know, the regulations have obviously been loosened. Uh, I know California is on a similar cadence, so it's been very recent here. In Canada, I think it's, you know, it's still, you know, a little bit behind um, these states that are, that are behind in the U.S. in terms of, but everyone's kind of feeling that direction of positive and it's, you know, um, you know, whether they, they're, Articulating the concept of herd immunity, if there's even conscious on people's general minds, that's kind of the mentality. Um, but what you're saying, I mean, I, that resonates with me. I mean, I, I know as, you know, doing business, um, you know, on the ground, not knowing the macro economic picture or not really knowing the macro health picture um, and, uh, and all those details, the... I'll say just in just kind of the individual little slices of, you know, anecdotal, like through our companies, but we're more connected than we've ever been. And what you said about, you know, having problems across the world and it, we're all, you know, it's all going to affect everybody. So you can't just stay in your own little, you can't be myopic and just focus on your own little backyard, your house. You got to think about your neighbors and the whole world. I mean, it resonates because even my little slice of the pie in terms of our companies that we work with, that we own, you know, one company um, sells in North America, but sources in China, sources in Bangladesh, um, you know, all the stuff that related to COVID and related to the economic effects and, and secondary and tertiary effects of COVID have all, and the reopening, have all affected that business. Um, you know, whether it's where we have to, where we could uh, source from reliably, um, where, you know, the shipping costs coming here, you know, uh, all these things. Another company, 
of ours. It's North American based, but it sells across the world and has a recreational product that it sells to the um, dive industry. So a lot of people locally started diving locally, but you know they sell across the world, and you know we get components from Asia to make in these technical products. And then we sell to you know dive shops and stuff across the whole world. And so you see Asia still locked down. Um, you're seeing, you know, Europe, different levels of, you know, health and and, um, and economic activity. And then we sell, you know, I'd say Latin America, Middle East and, or, or, or smaller markets. But, you know, all those. So and I keep going down a list of companies, but there are very few of our companies that don't have either some supply base or some market, you know, outside of the U.S. and that aren't affected by everything. So, you know, obviously there's a, you know, there's a human element of like, you know, what's going on and then how are people hurting and how can we help people? But there's just a really, you know, economically we're tied together, even in our mid middle market companies that we individually work with, not even at a macroeconomic level, just these individual little companies. We're so tied together now that, you know, it does resonate with me what you said about, um, you can't just, you know, focus on what's happening here and now, like in, in your immediate backyard. Yeah, yeah, Rashad, this is this is actually great, and I can I see that we're getting close to our time here, but uh, the conversation has been great. I wanted to keep going, but like one last question that like also resonates with something that we spoke I think last time that I that uh, I we were hanging out in New York, and and I promise I will go to New York hopefully next not next week but uh, the following week, but because uh, next week I'm gonna be away. Um, but um, here's the thing, Rashad. I don't know if you remember. Last time we spoke uh, in person, you you were talking about the issue, the trade war between the U.S. and China, right? And that how that was affecting a little bit your suppliers and the suppliers for your portfolio companies. And uh, I had um, I, I was working with a friend of mine who. I'm not going to be able to disclose exactly where he worked, but he was uh, inside the, the government and they were, um, how can I put this? They were debating the issue of 5G, right? Because there is like the, this consensus going on. And this is all very smart people in the U.S. government, of course, right? Nobody stupid there. Like there's this consensus going on that like 5G cannot be done by the Chinese, otherwise they're going to control our um, our information security, right? And then there's like the security, security, security talk, so we can't trust the Chinese with 5G, right? And and then like I was talking to like uh, uh, some of, some people and they were saying, yeah, but really – we had 4G with the Chinese, 3G with Chinese, 2G with the Chinese, right? Why do we we cannot have the 5G, right? And, and the answer is always like, no, we can't, we can't because it's dangerous, right? And, and we are like, yeah, but why? And then they say, oh, they can control our security. And then you look at the guy who's telling you that, who's giving you this advice, and which costs like half a million dollars, and the guy has an interest in actually making 5G in the U.S., and then you're like, because there's no really unbiased part party on this, right? And and also, I uh, remember that. Um, and then he was saying, and to make matter make matters worse, if we get five G from China, it's like ten billion, right? And if we get five G made in the U.S., it's gonna cost us half a trillion. And then we're like, dude, that's a huge bill that we're gonna have to pick up, just. Because you're telling me that we have to do that. And I don't really trust you, to be honest with you. You know, like, you're like, so, and then, like, but but anyway, now, like, uh, you know, the um, now, like, this is all done. I think that in Brazil, they're going to, they're going to, I don't, I don't know, but I think in England, they're not going to allow the Chinese. I think in Brazil, they're not going to allow the Chinese. I think this last trip, Biden went to Europe. I think they're going to stress that issue now and distressing the issue of the uh, the belt, uh, the belt road um, 
uh, initiative that the Chinese have, like to invest in infrastructure. Italy just said that they're gonna like renounce that. They're gonna work with the U.S. And and I remember that uh, a couple of years ago, the U.S. went to Brazil and they promised a billion dollars in infrastructure for Brazil. But then, like the Brazilian government was like, dude, the Chinese have invested a hundred billion dollars, and it's it's that crazy talk. But still, Brazil ended up siding with the United States, as you know, Bolsonaro and Trump and all that. Uh, and I think India is also siding with the United States. But oh, I, so there is like a huge economic cost in doing that. But I think that somehow uh, governments are biting the bullet and doing this. For you, you know, in your portfolio companies, are you guys biting the bullet? Are you guys Facing uh, this huge uh, cost, and, and you're and you're just changing your supplier network chain, or are you guys, how can I say this, like uh, adjusting and trying to work with China in a way that's, that doesn't threat, threaten like um, any of the more like um, safety concerns of the U.S. government? W- what's your view on this? Have you guys been moving away your supply chain from China? Yeah. So. Um interesting like when this whole tariff and trade war thing started you know uh, i'll talk about one of the companies that i'm uh, one of our companies that i'm on the board of but you know you could probably talk about other companies here uh, but there's one specifically that sourced almost all of its product from china and you know as a as a board we would discuss and debate you know is this like an idiosyncrasy of this particular administration at the time the trump administration and, you know, well, because it was a volatile situation. I mean, you'd have a tweet and the next thing you know, it's another 15 percent or thing, right? Like it was very unpredictable. And so, you know, as a company, how the way it boils down, you know, that trickles down, you know, you're trying to make a decision about, you know, major strategic um, aspects of the business. And uh, it was pretty volatile. And it, I'm talking about one company, but we're looking at other investing in other companies. We have some other companies that I that I'm not that I don't work on that also had similar discussions. And where we kind of came out as a group here was, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily an idiosyncrasy of the Trump administration that um, that those tariffs and that escalation of that quote unquote the trade war and all that. And that might have been a idiosyncrasy of that particular president and administration, but that we couldn't bet that there wouldn't be long-term friction between you know the U.S. and maybe more broadly the West and China for a variety of reasons. And those those facts and circumstances might change, but you know you have you know you have an existing world power, you have a rising world power, and you have um, and depending on the mix of politics and, and leaders we put in the mix, it could exacerbate, but typically that would lead to some kind of friction. And and we we made the judgment or, or the we made the judgment at the time that it was not a safe bet to say that, hey, once if Trump's out of office, everything's gonna go back to normal with China. It's gonna be perfect. Tariffs are gonna go away. There's gonna be no friction. It's gonna be, you know, everyone loves each other and trusts each other and back to you know 20 years ago. Um and I'm not going to go into all the detail. We can talk about that, you know, uh, forever. But we made the decision that it could be a long-term feature of the relationship. And so we decided that it's best to diversify from just being dependent on China or depending on the company, more dependent or less dependent. On China. Like, you know, to diversify to other places. At the very least, just for the purest and diversification of it. Just like you have diversification of stock portfolio. Like the China relationship could get worse, it could get better. But at least you, if you're diversified, you can shift forces, you know, um, you know, accordingly. And so we looked at, depending on the industry, like we looked at and, and transitioned some stuff to Vietnam, to Bangladesh. Um, and that way, you know, maybe things will get worse in Vietnam, or maybe there'll be some factor that I mean, some of the Vietnamese companies are right, probably owned by you know, Chinese-owned company. Um, Maybe there's some issues in Bangladesh, like infrastructure-wise, with blackouts or something. You know, there's like different issues in different places. There's just, maybe the situation in China is going to go terrific, you know, in a year from now. I mean, what we found is the world is unpredictable, and you know, it, probably there's certain things that go in certain directions. But we just decided that um, we needed to diversify so that we can kind of shift between uh, suppliers and, and countries. 
um, to, to mitigate some of that risk with China. We thought the China, fundamentally, we thought the China risk wasn't just Trump administration risk. We thought there was a long term. And it looks like it's actually played out that way. I mean, the tariffs haven't gone away. Like the new, um, uh, you know, administration is still using that as a bargaining chip. Obviously, we're having other frictions with China across, um, uh, you know, across the new administration and across the Western world, as you mentioned. And so, um, yeah, I think diversification is, you know, for us, down to our little companies, you know, that was the name of the game. And, and it seems like it was so far a good decision. I will add one one note to that, that um, that said, China has been such a reliable supplier because COVID's got, you know, taken away out of China quickly. Supply chains are the most robust. Um, you know, they're just, you know, top exporter, right? So uh, on one hand, we are looking, you know, we've been working to diversify. On the other hand, in a world of like COVID demand and stimulus demand and trying to get products out of, um, you know, imported and made and imported, we've actually conversely like gone back to China a lot because they're the most reliable suppliers that could service, you know, the demand, the huge consumer demand in the U.S. Um, over the past year. So, so you think that like, uh, and I'm trying to wrap this up, but so you think that like uh, to diver- diversify away from China, we end up to pay, we end up paying a premium, even though it's good to diversify always. Um, so I didn't, I did not address your question of like, I don't know about, like you said, the 5G and certain other areas where, um, that's a policy decision and, you know, it might cost a lot more money and, um, well, for you, kind of for you, governmental. but I'll say for our companies, you know, we're not going to pay, we got to think for our companies, we're paying tariffs, right? And so it squeezes, it squeezes your margins. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for the types of companies I'm working with, if you go to Vietnam or Bangladesh, like you might actually be paying lower, like overall cost of goods. And reliable? And reliable? And the question is reliability, exactly. Like, can they produce? Will it be on time? And that's why I was saying earlier, conversely, while we're diversifying, we're also finding ourselves, you know, hovering back towards China for certain key goods, key customers, because um, the reliability in the infrastructure, they're an exporting power. But that's the decision. We literally, like you said, Reliable. That we have like major, like matrices and board meetings. Like here are the pros, cons, not just cost, but reliability, infrastructure on time. You know, regulations, geopolitical situation, all that. And then you know, we use that to try to you know keep an eye on all those things. Yeah. Rashad, it's been more than an hour. Like this has been excellent. It was very nice to be able to talk to you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I think this was like. Um, uh, gave a perspective for people who are interested in working in private equity, people who are interested in understanding what's going on in the U.S. and the rest of the world in terms of uh, the economic recovery. And uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, I think that um, um, we're going to be, um, I'm going to continue to do the training for um, the banks in Wall Street. I'm going to also do some training for people who are interested in private equity, some of the financial modeling And uh, I'm going to be sharing the link later on with some of the students who are here if they're interested in learning more. Rashad, thank you so much, my friend. And I'm going to go to New York and see you again soon, okay? Forward to seeing you. And thanks for the opportunity. And uh, it was a pleasure talking to you as always, Bernardo. All right. Thank you so much, Rashad. Stay well. Have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming in. Take care, guys.